Hi, I'm Stephen Karadianis, conductor of the Plymouth Philharmonic. Well, the year 2020 is going to go down in the history books as a real extraordinary year for all sorts of reasons. So let me choose one. Since I am a conductor of orchestras, allow me to take this time to acknowledge that the year 2020 is the 250th anniversary year of the birth of the great Ludwig von Beethoven. That's how I want to remember the year 2020. So let's have a little bit of a chat about the music of Beethoven, specifically his nine symphonies, because to me as an orchestra conductor, what makes Beethoven so special that in his nine symphonies, he forges two different paths for the composers following him to be inspired by and to follow themselves. So before we actually talk about these two paths forged by these nine symphonies, let's talk about the origins of the symphony as we know it. Backing up to the Viennese classical period, we have the two great composers that we know, Franz Josef Haydn and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And chronologically speaking, there's a little bit of a composer sandwich here because Haydn was born first and inspired the young Mozart. And then Mozart was a fireball of a composer and a creative genius. And he also lived a short life, right? Haydn lived well past Mozart, and the later Haydn was inspired by Mozart. So you have this Haydn, Mozart, Haydn creative sandwich, if you will. And during their creative output, through their music, they formalized various instrumental forms that we know. The string quartet, the symphony, the concerto, and the solo sonata, these multi-movement forms. We know that um, the carryover from the Baroque period, if it was just strictly instrumental music, how do you keep things vibrant and interesting? Through variation and variety. And the variety of fast, slow, fast was always very important. So in terms of multi-movement pieces of music, the concerto and the solo sonata are in three movements, fast, slow, fast, two fast movements with a contrasting slower lyrical section in between. The symphony and the string quartet evolved similarly in terms of fast, slow, fast, but between the slow movement and the final fast movement, was inserted a dance form from the Baroque period called the Minuet, which is why we have these four movement symphonies and string quartets that were a fast opening movement, a slow lyrical movement, a minuet, and a final finale fast movement. And so that is basically the format of the multi-movement pieces of music that Mozart and Haydn handed over to Beethoven. And the other thing to think about is that the orchestra as an entity was also being standardized. Uh, so Mozart and Haydn basically handed over the standardized instrumentation of what was then the full orchestra of two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, and two bassoons, two French horns, two trumpets, timpani, and a band of strings, a string orchestra of first violin, second violin, viola, cello, bass. So this is now what Mozart and Haydn hand over to Beethoven. Now, Beethoven writes how many symphonies? Well, you know the answer to that. But let me first ask, how many symphonies did Haydn write? Haydn wrote 104 symphonies. How many symphonies did 
Mozart write? Mozart wrote 41 symphonies. How many symphonies did Beethoven write? You know, he wrote nine symphonies. 104, 41, nine. It's not like Beethoven was some sort of underachiever as compared to Mozart and Haydn. It's just that by the time Beethoven accepted the form of the symphony, and when Beethoven himself started to write in the form of the symphony, Beethoven himself gave the form, the symphony, such importance that it was itself the musical vessel into which a composer would pour their most profound musical thought. So his symphonies, by comparison to the others that came before, were certainly grander works, ultimately. So we started by saying that through the nine symphonies, the nine symphonies of Beethoven, he forges two different compositional paths that composers would follow later. So let's talk about them. These paths, let's call one of the traditional classicists. And on the other side, we have the expansive romantics. Symphony number no. one of Beethoven follows very much the model of Mozart and Haydn. Four movements in the same sort of movement structure, opening fast movement, slow lyrical movement, the third movement minuet, and then the final fourth movement. So solidly, the first symphony of Beethoven follows this classical path. The second symphony of Beethoven also follows the classical path of Mozart and Haydn, but with one big exception. He had an issue, Beethoven had an issue with the form, the minuet. Why? Because the form itself involved absolutely strict repetitions. And when you have absolute strict repetitions, then, you know, by the time you get to that last section that's going to finish off, you know how it's going to end because you've heard all the music and it ends in an exact repetition. And Beethoven didn't like that. So he developed a new movement to go in place of the minuet. He wanted a movement that you couldn't guess which way it was going to go. And that movement he called the scherzo. And if you're an, an Italian scholar, you know that the word scherzo translates to the word joke, J-O-K-E. And of course, with a joke, you don't know the punchline. So you really don't know how things are going to go until the very end. And that's what Beethoven liked about the scherzo. So symphony number two of Beethoven follows similarly the, the, the classical proportions of Mozart and Haydn and indeed his own first symphony. But the second replaces the minuet for the scherzo. Now, symphony number three of Beethoven, the Eroica symphony, the Bonaparte symphony, if you know the story. Uh, Beethoven really wanted to celebrate the, 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 the human spirit in his music. And he initially called this symphony the Bonaparte symphony. But when he heard that Bonaparte himself anointed himself emperor of all things, Beethoven said, no, I don't want to celebrate that. I want, it, I want to celebrate the common man, the heroic individual. So he tears out the title page of Bonaparte and he writes in Eroica, heroic, celebrating the heroic spirit of the common person. 
The Eroica Symphony was huge by comparison to any other symphony that came before. Even the first movement was so much longer than most other pieces of music up until that time. He also expands the standard orchestration. We talked about woodwinds and pairs, two horns, two trumpets and timpani. He adds an extra horn in there just to expand, to give more possibilities for pitches, because at that time the horns without valves were, were only able to play certain notes, and he wanted to expand that texture. So definitely the Eroica Symphony, Symphony Number no. 3, follows this expansive romantic path. Symphony Number no. 4 goes back to the classical path of his symphonies number no. one and two, again, still now utilizing the scherzo in the third movement. Symphony number no. five, fate knocking at the door, da 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 da, right? Of course, that's now fo following the expansive track. And the first three movements, Although the music is all novel and new, I mean, he's developing a huge soundscape from just four notes, da 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 da. The very last movement, he adds instruments. So to the, to the standard instrumentation of the orchestra of the time, he adds in this last movement, a piccolo to add an extra octave up top a contrabassoon to add an extra octave to the bottom, and three trombones to fatten up the middle. And at that time, the trombones were not an instrument of the symphony, but the trombone was the instrument of the church. And you'd hear it in choral music and church music. So in essence, when the trombones come in, that is the choir of humanity joining this triumphant C major finale. That is the, the culmination of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. So we have one, two, three, four, five, in terms of directions. Number six, the Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral Symphony. Yes, we have to put it in this expansive romantic territory but it's also in a category by itself because the sixth symphony is a program symphony. The pastoral symphony tells a musical story. And so program music, the textbook definition is non-vocal music that takes as its inspiration something non-musical. Uh, probably your most familiar program music might be Paul Dukas' Sorcerer's Apprentice, where just strictly through music, you see Mickey Mouse as the wizard and all that sort of thing. You know, of course, Fantasia paints pictures for you, but before there was Fantasia, you just had the sound of the Sorcerer's Apprentice telling you this whole story. Another very famous program music example would be Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition, especially that final great gate of Kiev that comes in as a majestic finale. So that's program music. And the sixth symphony of Beethoven is his program symphony, the only one that he wrote. So yes, we'll put that in the expansive romantic, but that also be got, uh, belongs in a category unto itself. Symphony number no. seven, my favorite of the Beethoven symphonies, by the way, Symphony 7 was the favorite of Beethoven's favorite Beethoven symphonies. It was his favorite amongst all of his symphonic children. That seventh symphony belongs in that expansive romantic lane. The eighth symphony belongs back in that classical direction. Uh, as a matter of fact, for the eighth symphony, he even goes back to the minuet in the third movement as something special. And his Ninth Symphony, his Choral Odes to Joy Symphony, expansive as all get out. He has everything in the orchestra, including the kitchen sink. He adds a very large contingent of percussion. 
to the trombones, to the full orchestra, to the chorus and the soloists. Uh, his tremendous statement musically. Uh, it's, it's just, to me, uh, inconceivable that someone could write such music at a point in his own life that he was totally deaf. He didn't hear a note of it. He's a special guy, this Beethoven. And through these nine symphonies, he has two paths, the classical path and the expansive romantic path. Who are the composers that followed his classical path? Brahms. Schubert, Schumann, Mendelssohn. Who are the composers that followed that expansive romantic path? Bruckner, Wagner, Mahler, all those errs, how serious can you get? And so with just nine symphonies, he shows us two different directions. And he shows the composers to follow two different ways to go and yet still be expressive in their own right. There are so many different reasons why Beethoven is special. To me, as an orchestra conductor, he shows us a whole lot through his nine symphonies. And for that, I'm very grateful. Happy birthday, Ludwig van Beethoven. You look and sound great at 250.